we are now entering the fields of vehicle derived extracellular vesicles. And just in case you haven't attended this very nice workshop on extracellular vesicles, uh, a very brief summary of, for you. Uh, if you haven't heard about extracellular vesicles, I think everybody has heard about extracellular vesicles now. So extracellular vesicles are, um, as mentioned here, um, lipid bilayer determined particles um, which can contain various um, components, and this includes nearly all biomolecules we know so far. Um, when we talk about, or uh, uh, there's a huge heterogeneity of extracellular vesicles. Some of them, this is really just a brief overview of what we know about extracellular vesicles, is depicted here. And uh, when people talk about extracellular vesicles, they mainly focus on these two types, namely the microvesicles and the so-called exosomes that are, are um, named based after their origin and their biogenesis route. But we don't go into detail into that. So why extracellular vesicles are so important or so interesting? Um, this is already explained by this issue here, that they can contain several biomolecules. And uh, this allows them to fulfill a certain biological function, so they are very important in terms of cell-cell -cell communication. So some of these important functions are summarized here. I don't want to go into detail, but one thing I like to highlight is that they can regulate um, the, the gene expression of a recipient cell. We already heard in the last talk, EVs are released by cells, so EVs are released by every known cell so far. So when everything what is released can be taken up by another partner, by another cell. So on this recipient cell can be manipulated somehow or <clears throat> uh, by the EV, which is either detected or attached to this to the cell or even taken up. Um, yes, um, with that, despite all these very nice functions EVs can have, we also might think about that they simply act as a disposal pathway, so something that cells don't need, just kicked out in form of extracellular vesicles. Um, but disposal means not always, okay, this is just rubbish, get rid of the waste of it. Um, you can see some kind of, uh, of a recycling uh, route, so maybe there are some biomolecules one cell do not need, but another cell would need, so this is kind of a recycling we have here. And um, what we are looking at in particular in our lab is the role of extracellular vesicles within the tumor microenvironment. So the tumor microenvironment is defined as the place which surrounds a specific tumor. For instance, we are interested in PDAC, so in uh, pancreatic cancer. And uh, we have the tumor itself, the tumor cells, which are surrounded by, <clears throat> I wouldn't call it the portal cells, but <laughs> by the microenvironment. These are mainly the, the blood vessels and the lymphatic vessels. We have a lot of fibroblasts building up this extracellular matrix. And we have a lot of immune cells floating around the, the tumor, hopefully trying to kill the tumor. But as we know, it, in some cases, it doesn't work that nice. So what are EVs doing in the tumor microenvironment? EVs are released by the tumor itself. They're released by the immune cells itself. There's a strong interaction between all these kind of cells we find in the tumor microenvironment. And what is known what EVs do in the tumor environment, for instance, they enhance the angiogenesis. Um, they do some kind of transforming cells into tumor-associated cells, like the fibroblast. This is a very nice example for that. So we have the fibroblast, and um, extracellular vesicles can contribute to the transformation from fibroblasts into so-called CAFs the cancer-associated fibroblasts. Um, EVs are known to be involved in the extracellular matrix remodeling. So you might know that in, the car, uh, in cancer tissues or in the tumor microenvironment, we have a strong extracellular matrix remodelation, which is also um, <coughs> um, achieved by the extracellular vesicles. They have, of course, enrolled, uh, involved in metastas metastasis. Um, they can also play an important role in therapy resistance. And what we are especially looking at, <clears throat> they have a potential in immune world that they do have some immune modulatory functions, and these can be either in activating phase or in a depressing state. So they can activate immune cells or depress immune cells, depending on the AV you look at. 
So this is somehow summarized. Oops, sorry. Summarized here. And of course, there are a bunch of immune cells which you find in the tumor microenvironment. And we, in particular, look in a little bit more in detail in the, in the so called NK cells. I think everybody knows what NK cells are, but just as a reminder for the non immunologists, um, I'm also a non immunologist, so um, it's often also nice for me to see again what natural killer cells are doing. So NK cells are blood lymphocytes, around 10 to 20 percent um, of the peripheral blood lymphocytes. Uh, as the name already indicates, they can kill indiscriminately, so uh, they are easily irritable. Um, they do it by releasing a lot of cytokines, uh, sorry, uh, paraffins and granzymes, so they release cytotoxic stuff to the cells and they are immediately killed. Um, they are usually uh, for the, the killing of tumor cells or in particular also for uh, virus infected cells. And uh, this activation is a highly balanced process, which you see here. Um, usually, NK cells are always ready to kill. So if they find a cell which doesn't express, for instance, MHC class 1, which is expressed in nearly every cell, um, if they find a cell without MHC1, like here, you're dead. Um, but even if a cell has MHC1, uh, a bunch of other receptors and ligands which can still activate the NK cell. So there is a fine balance between inhibition and activating of the NK cells. And this is exactly what we are looking at. So these are a few examples of the receptors besides the MHC class 1, uh, which we find on the K cells and the corresponding ligands. And of course, I don't want to go too detail into that. I just show you that because uh, in the later slides, you will uh, see why. So, uh, since we are focusing on, on one particular, this is better here, on one particular receptor and the corresponding ligand, namely NKP30, and the ligand is the so called BAC6 and P7H6. These are the two proteins, which are usually membrane bound, as indicated here, which activate or can activate NK cells to in the action of this receptor. And um, what we know already so far, what is BAC6, for instance, doing, um, as I said, this is a membrane bound, or usually a membrane bound uh, protein. It regulates the NK cell activity, as you have seen. Uh, it can also promote T cell response and the inhibition of prometastatic neutrophils. And interestingly, what we observe is if we have a tumor cell where we observe a lack or a mutation of BAC6, which is common in tumor cells, and we observed a strong influence in the EV biogenesis. So first, the loading of the specific cargo of the extracellular vesicles is influenced, and we know, or what we also could show is that BAC6 itself is associated with extracellular vesicles. And if we have a mutation or complete lack of these proteins, of course, we have EVs without BAC6. And we think clear differences between Sorry, between EVs that harbor BAC6 on the surface or that don't have BAC6 on the surface. And uh, this is something we also tested in vitro, just uh, to show you how, how we, we proved that. So we isolated NK cells for this assay from, from healthy donors, and we isolated EVs, which were expressed in cell culture, um, which either express BAC6 on the surface, so they were expressed in HEC293 cells. HEC293 cells do not express BAC6. Therefore, we overexpressed BAC6 and uh, generating thereby uh, EVs that contain BAC6. We also used the other ligand, P7H6, isolated the, these EVs. And as a control, we used the protein itself, incubated either the EVs or the protein with the NK cells, used those NK cells and did first. And case cell panel, what we call in case cell panel, we simply check for the activation of different markers on the NK cells. And further on, we use these NK cells and put them on uh, reported cells. These are the K567. This is a leukemia cell line which lacks the MHC class 1. So these are really nice targets for NK cells. And this is what we call then a killing assay. And um, yeah, just 
to show you that we were able first to overexpress BAC6, as you see in the investment plot, and also P7H6. And in addition, if we purified then the extracellular vesicles, we could detect BAC6 on the EVs, whereas P7H6 could only be detected in the supernatant, but not in the, on the EVs, indicating that, from this first hint, indicating that BAC6 might really be associated with the extracellular vesicles, whereas P7H6 is present in a soluble form. Yes. And in the next step, we further characterized the isolated extracellular vesicles doing nanofloid cytometry. This is what you see here. So we used a bunch of AV markers, common AV markers. These are tetraspanins. These are somehow involved in the biogenesis of the extracellular vesicles. We can prove, okay, we have AVs somehow. And we also check for the expression of the two proteins. So we have as a control the wild type. But it's more here. So we have the wild type. As I said, these are uh, sorry, wild type EVs derived from HEC293, which usually do not expect BAC6. And as you see, we could not detect any BAC6 over here. If we overexpress BAC6, we see that we could detect BAC6 on extracellular vesicles. And again, also in nanofloor cytometry, we don't find P7H6 associated with the extracellular vesicles. On the right hand side, you see then the killing assay, what I said. So we incubate the NK cells with the uh, report cell on the top for the BAC6 uh, and the bottom for B7H6. Uh, and to summarize this up, if we have a wreath that con can contain or that contain BAC6, the uh, induced cell death is increased, indicating that. X6 on extracellular vesicles boost the activity of NK cells. Whereas when we don't have X6 on the EVs, maybe have like white type, nothing happens. So NK cells are activated, but nothing more. If we have interestingly soluble X6, so not attached to a membrane, as I said, this is usually a membrane protein, rather see an, a reduction of the NK cell activity. And the same, or it's even more obvious, for P7H6, we have soluble forms of P7H6, the, uh, the killing ratio is significantly reduced, indicating that BAC6 on extracellular vesicles seems to be the good guys. So they activate the immune cells, and this is something you want to have in the tumor microenvironment, whereas the soluble proteins do the opposite. Um, Yes, we also, as I said, we, we performed um, the, the NK cell panel where we look for other markers on the NK cells if they are activated. And we see some of these markers are activated upon, um, uh, not activated, but uh, reduced upon treatment of the soluble proteins here only. So for you see NK G2D, which is an important activation mark uh, uh, receptor. So if you activate the cells with either BAC6 or B7H6, the, uh, the expression is strongly diminished, as you see here, indicating that this shuts down the NK cell. Um, yes, and we did this also uh, for NKB30 on a um, transcriptional level. So um, we see that the soluble BAC6 leads to a clear reduction of the expression of some of these markers. Um, yes. Coming then back to, to to a more detailed question, okay, what is BAC6 and these EVs are doing in the tumor microenvironment? The hypothesis based on our findings before was that BAC6 somehow shapes the tumor environment by activating uh, the NK cells, or if it's in a soluble form, um, um, reducing the activation of NK cells. Um, and as you see, that the BAC6 effect we observed is somehow mediated by extracellular vesicles in a good way. And what we are aiming in this project then was to phenotype um, the tumor and the recruited immune cells in the absence of BAC6. So is there a difference between a, I wouldn't say healthy tumor, but a tumor expressing BAC6 and some tumors which don't have BAC6 or have as any effect on the tumor progression? And therefore we performed transcriptomics as well as proteomics of the EVs as well as the tumor cells. 
And um, we also were thinking about an in vivo study using the Crelock system and combining this with single cell sequencing uh, to elucidate the tumor EVs impact on the recruited immune, immune cells in the tumor microenvironment. And uh, why is BAC6 in the tumor environment so important? As I said, we are some of the tumors we are focusing is uh, pancreatic cancer. And uh, what is known is that a low BAC6 expression in patients is uh, correlated with a poor prognosis. And this is what you see here. So we haven't read patients which had, which had a low BAC6 expression for, um, and compared to those with a higher or normal BAC6 expression. And this is uh, significantly, significantly correlated with the poor prognosis if you have no BAC6. Um, yes, on the right hand side, you see the expression of BAC6. So what was our, our idea? So we thought, okay, we can maybe use the Crelox system. What's the Crelox system? So we have some cells, in this case, tumor cells. So we switch into the mouse model in this case. So we used to have pancreatic tumor cells, which is called PANO2, um, where we, which were transfected, stably transfected, uh, with plasmid uh, platin expressing um, the Cree recombinase. And this is something what was known already before. The Cree recombinase can either be transferred as a protein itself, or the mRNA is thought to be transferred via extracellular vesicles to some recipient cells. Okay, it doesn't matter. So for this, you need then a reporter cell, and these are the reporter cells shown here. Uh, in our case, we used uh, a reporter mouse. So this mouse has uh, the Velox P system in it. And the LOX P system marks these sites where the tree, wrong, tree recombinase can cut and do the recombinator, inducing the recombination. And what we have here is in the reporter cells, we have usually a D-tomato. So the cells somehow look a little bit red. If you incubate them with a recombinase, with a tree recombinase, this D-tomato is cut out, and instead of the T-tomato, a GFP is expressed, which is um, um, downstream of the T-tomato. And this can be easily pulled up under the microscopes, since the GFP is expressed, the cells turn green, indicating we have a successful recombination mediated by the Cree. This is something we can easily detect, so we don't see here any red T-tomato. Um, Cells, but what we see is uh, these are the PANO2 out of tumor tissue where we have the a Cree a minus wild type. So there's no Cree. They can't detect anything. If we have a Cree back six knockout or wild type, you see the cells turning green more or less. It's just simply proving that the method works in this piece. Okay, um, what we did is, as I said, we established these cell lines and check first if the expression of the Cree wild type and a Cree back 6 knockout, which we use here, these are the PANO2 cells, which usually express back 6 so we generated the knockout here, if this has any influence of the cell growth. Uh, first in cell culture, and we didn't observe a big difference, so the back 6 knockout itself doesn't have any huge impact, uh, at least in cell culture. We isolated then the extracellular vesicles, we see a slight increase of the particle count in, in the back 6 knockout cells. Just simply characterized these EVs, which were isolated from, from, the, um, um, from the cell culture derived EVs. And after that, we more or less switched into the in vivo model. We have two different models. We have one, the subcutaneous model. In the subcutaneous model, again, we use the panel 2, either wild type or the uh, back 6 knockout tree injected into the mouse, and then after, I think the pictures are after 30 days, uh, we checked tumor volume and compared wild type to uh, back 6 knockout, and I think this is quite obvious uh, that we see a huge difference in tumor volume when you compare wild type versus back 6 knockout, and you can also see this here, so this is knockout, you see uh, when we knock out back 6, we have a tremendous tumor growth compared to the wild type. However, this is a subcutaneous model. This is somehow not reflecting the case in the PDAC. 
Therefore, we switched to an orthohelpic model where the panel two are more or less, if you hit them, directly injected into the pancreas. Um, but to dump this up, uh, we have the same effect here. So we have here the wild type. This is the tumor. So you see here, this white tissue here, the spleen, but this is the pancreas and the tumor. And this is a wild type. And if you look down here, you see the back six knockout. And you see again a huge tumor. This is also something if we do surgery and dissect the pancreas, including the tumor, and also determine the tumor volume. Uh, even in this orthopopic model, we see a uh, huge impact of the back six on the tumor growth. Okay, and then we were interested in the tumor microenvironment. How can we analyze the tumor microenvironment using this Crelock system and the back six um, knockout models? So again, we used this orthotopic model, injecting the mice. After a few weeks, depending on how the tumor grows, we uh, take out the pancreatic tumor and do a dissection of the tumor and the digestion. Uh, do cell suspension, perform then a single cell pre-analysis with the Rhapsody. And uh, uh, in our case, we did a library preparation and sequencing and then uh, single cell sequencing of the cells. So we primarily look for um, immune cells, since we're interested in immune cells. So we use the, BD, uh, the, 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 the Rhapsody and do pre-selection for CD45 positive cells. CD45 is the common marker for all leukocytes, so for more or less all immune cells. And uh, for the sequencing, and you see something like this. You observed, I think, in the end, 12 or 13 clusters um, in single cell sequencing. Um, after that, we have somehow to, to align these clusters to the individual uh, immune cells. And this is something we did. I will show this in a minute, in a minute um, that this is more or less clear what kind of uh, immune cells we have. We have clearly separated here the T cells. We could nicely distinguish between CD8 plus and CD4 plus T cells. We have the macrophages and here our NK cells and again the fibroblasts, which also can be seen as some kind of uh, immune cell within the tumor microenvironment, I would say. Okay. After this, we dissected and compared wild type versus knockout, and this is what you see here. On top, we have wild type panel two, and here the bug six um, knockout, and we see already here a clear difference. So we have, in general, more immune cells in the bug six, which is similarly to the fact that the tumor is much larger, much immune, more immune cells are recruited to this place, but we also see some differences in the individual clusters. First of all, we see strong accumulation of fibroblasts. But we don't, I don't into, go into detail for fibroblasts. Uh, but what we see also here is macrophages, as well as the mast cells down here. And um, this was simple single cell sequencing without the Crelock system. And now we made use of the Crelock system, since the Crelock system can be somehow sorted out, or these cells with the Crelock system can be sorted out since they are GFP positive. So we can check for the GFP positive cells and look for the expression or the, 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 the abundance of the GFP positive cells. And again, this is what you see. There are not that much GFP positive cells in the panel two, indicating that this recombination effect isn't that big. So indicating somehow that either the EVs are inefficiently transfer the bug six protein mRNA to the recipient cell, or the recombination took no place in these cells. But what we see is there are two populations where this recombination takes place. The one was somehow assumed for us because these are the macrophages of the monocytes, and these are the cells supposed to take up everything what's coming around. So the monocytes are known to, to take up the most of the bees which are floating around or circulating. But what was very interesting for us is um, that we found mast cells. Because mast cells weren't, at least, I don't know that mast cells were reported to be involved in the tumor microenvironment or to play an important role in the tumor microenvironment. Um, mast cells are known to release a lot of histamine, so, so they're important for allergic reactions and something, uh, but not for in, within the tumor microenvironment. 
you know, this is something we are now following up why mast cells are taken up so much of these. As I said, we did this for the tumor itself, for the tumor microenvironment. And uh, picking up this was what Peter was showing in the, in, the, in, the, in the first talk, we also analyzed the blood of these mice and performed single cell sequencing of the blood and also looked for GFP recombination and pre recombination in the blood. But there was nearly nothing. And this is going in the direction like that we have more or less a real concentrated space where the action takes place. So we have the tumor microenvironment where the cells are in close proximity, and there we have the cell cell communication where in the blood can be either simply diluted um, or, um, or it is diluted, I would say, and it's then more looking for really the needle in the haystack to find a tumor derived TV which is circulating in the blood. So again, it's better to go in close proximity to the place where the action takes place. Yes, um, as I said, we have macrophages in the mast cells. And of course, we somehow have to prove that these are really the mast cells and the, the, the macrophages and all the others. Uh, therefore, uh, we have a panel of different markers indicating here based on the uh, single cell sequencing. And uh, just as an example, this cluster 10, which is here in the first row, these are, uh, well, this corresponds to this cluster you don't see down here. Uh, so most likely the bees, uh, the, the master, sorry. And these uh, red arrows indicate the very typical and clear markers for mast cells. So um, you can also have a further look in the expression of these uh, typical mast cell markers here. So you see them quite small, I think, but you see this red bars here indicating that these are solely expressed more or less in this cluster and clearly indicating that this is mast cells and we could do this for the other clusters as well. Um, of course, this was single cell sequencing based on a mice experiment. So this were only three mice. And to enlarge a little bit the cohort, so to say, uh, we performed QR, uh, QRT PCR, RT QPCR, sorry, um, for more tumors, so for more individuals, uh, to clearly prove that this uh, can be reproduced. And this is what you see here. So we are now on, on the way to, to analyze this in more detail. We also, instead of injecting tumor cells and looking what the tumor cells are doing, directly inject AVs um, isolated from cell culture, which also harbors the pre lock system, to prove that this effect is really mediated by the AVs itself, or if this is simply a recombination which takes place uh, due to the close proximity. Yes, with this, I already like to finish off. I showed you that the absence of BAC6 strongly in, can strongly impact the tumor volume and aggressiveness. Um, you could show this in vitro as well as in the vivo model. So this is somehow referred as a preclinical uh, model of pancreatic cancer. Um, we could use in the first attempt, or shown in the first attempt, but we can use the Cree lock system as kind of a reporter system for uh, the transfer of extracellular vesicles. I think that, that will be what we believe in the tumor microenvironment. And um, yes, as I mentioned, the back 6 is associated with enhanced EV uptake uh, of mast cells, macrophages, and to some kinds of also uh, dendritic cells, but macrophage and dendritic cells so belong to the monocytes and other neutrophil or neutrophils. Um, and we're now trying to investigate especially what the mast cells are doing because this is somehow not explainable yet for us. <laughs> um, yes. And with this, I'd like to thank the people who are involved in this work, and as I said, especially Bilal, who are the one uh, who is uh, taking care of this project and did nearly all of the, the mouse experiments or mice experiments, um, and all our collaboration partners. And of course, I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Chris. Questions? Very nice talk. Thank you. So did you also look at soluble BAC6 in the tumor microenvironment of the mice? Um, 
in the tumor microarray, I have to check for the, it's quite difficult because um, we observe or we detect in the mass spectrometry since we isolated the EVs out of the, the um, tumor microenvironment on the EVs, we could detect uh, um, um, back six and also in the, the it's called supernatant. Um, might be soluble back six, but of course I cannot really say if this is um, um, somehow ripped off of the, from the EVs during the procedure and so on. Yes. So since there are no more questions and since we are running quite late, <laughs> we close down. Thank you very much, Chris. <laughs> Homage to Florence, thank you.